and welcome back and welcome on board to any newcomers. We have just finished our uh, first topic today on technology and data. And if you couldn't join that one, uh, you can stream it later from our website. It will be uploaded uh, in the afternoon. This presentation that's coming now, it deals with use, support and maintenance. We will spend 20 minutes on introducing the topic, then we will provide some industry statistics, and then uh, we will give a video recorded case. We finished the session with a five minute Q&A, so please shoot any questions that you might have in the Q&A function uh, down here in, in Zoom. The chat is for you to share any relevant data and to present yourself if, if you're a newcomer. So the topic that we're uh, going to discuss now will be presented by Associate Professor Daniela Picasso. And Daniela has a background in environmental and industrial engineering. And through her research in eco-design, she has looked at many ways of extending the use phase of products. Daniela will be supported by Tim McAloon, who's leading the match project. And he's a professor here at DTU Mechanical Engineering. He's diving deep into product service systems, sustainability and circular economy. Daniela, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Lasse. And uh, the third mega trend is actually urbanization. So now you've got the three of them. The focus now is- What does that mean for newcomers? <laughs> yes, we just discussed before that there are three very big mega trends shaping the world just now. One of them is digitalization. The second one is circular economy and the third one is urbanization. And I was just mentioning that at the point that we managed to bring together digitalization and circular economy, we can really uh, unlock the potential of both and have a quite big influence in the way the world will look like in a few years from now. But now what we are going to do is to talk about use, support and maintenance and how important it is in order to ensure uh, a circular economy and in order to help us to in fact decouple value creation from resource consumption by extending the lifetime uh, of products and uh, why is that important right uh, there's this really good the depiction of how value is destroyed in a linear economy which shows that in the pre-use phase, we are extracting raw materials, we are manufacturing parts, we are putting them together, we are selling them to the user, and the product actually reaches the maximum value when it meets the user and starts to fulfill the function that it was designed for. And what happens in a linear economy is that the value is simply destroyed in the post-use, which means that when the user doesn't want to have that product anymore, it simply goes to waste. At the best, it's going to have some of the materials recycled, but most of the value is lost uh, along the way. And we actually, we want to do in a circular economy is to uh, change the way we recover value so that instead of destroying, we are retaining value through a number of different circular economy strategies. So at the highest point, what we are doing is to reuse uh, the product. So ensuring that by maintaining them properly, by providing spare parts, and by keeping them uh, functioning for a longer time, then they will be fulfilling the function of the user and there will be no need for new products instead. When it's not possible, we can also try to go to the second mark uh, by doing refurbishment, remanufacturing and bringing the product back on, maybe to another uh, user. When it's not possible again, what we can do is to use some of the parts uh, as repair for other products that are still functioning and uh, try to, to keep the value at the parts level. And then when it's not possible, what we do is to recover the value of the materials by uh, recycling technologies. And our discussion today is on the inner circle. So how do we keep the product running uh, by a longer time by enabling support and maintenance during uh, the use phase? Um, so there's a very interesting uh, survey done by the uh, Europe Commission, which shows that about 77% of EU citizens 
would prefer to repair their devices than replace them. Uh, it's not really what happens today, but there's the willingness and the behavior uh, change showing here that customers would actually prefer to do so. And more importantly than that, the survey also shows that about 80% of those citizens think that the manufacturers should be required to make it easier to repair uh, products or to replace individual parts. So most of the materials added in there can be used for longer. There's also this uh, report from the Ellor, Ellen McCartan Foundation, which shows what are today the biggest barriers for repairing products. And they are mostly two. Uh, the most represented ones is the lack of repair information. So the user doesn't really know uh, how to repair the products on stay uh, break, but also the lack of spare parts at a competitive price. And uh, sometimes I'm sure you've experienced that. It is cheaper to just go and buy a new product than it is to repair an existing product. That's extremely frustrating uh, for the consumer, but also not a very good idea from a sustainability or a circular economy perspective. And what they also do here is to propose some recommendations on how to uh, enhance repair in general. And of course, making information more available, the same for spare parts and accessories, but also designing repairable products. And here we come back to the dimension that we discussed yesterday, the product and service innovation that had some important um, areas focused on design for repair. What's interesting here in Europe just now is that we have the Circular Economy Action Plan. And yes, uh, last year in 2020, they uh, approved a new uh, initiative called the Right to Repair which aims to enhance repair uh, of products, mostly electronics for now, and to put a lot of the responsibility for doing that on the manufacturers. So we will most likely see a lot of change in that area in the way that products are developed and maintained during the use phase that will lead to a higher uh, repair rate than we have today. And I have a short video for you uh, showing what different countries in Europe are doing just now in order to enhance the repair rates. Let's have a look into that. Pushing for repairable products and waste prevention is about a lot more than what is decided in Brussels. Much is happening across Europe at local and national level. For example, in Sweden, people can get tax breaks for appliance repairs done in their homes by technicians. Similarly, residents of the Austrian city of Graz can apply for small grants covering 50% of the labour cost of repairs. In France from 2021, shoppers will be able to compare the repairability score of some electrical products when buying in stores and online. In Norway, most consumer electronic products already come with a five-year warranty. And there is more proposed legislation that needs our support in the UK and Italy. In the UK, there are plans to require manufacturers of connected products to state the minimum duration of software support. And in Italy, a proposed planned obsolescence law would ensure spare parts are available for products and that they are reasonably priced. This is just the beginning. Help us spread the right to repair across Europe by pushing for better legislation at local, national and EU level. Yeah, so that also shows uh, the connection with other dimension in the match platform that is uh, policy and market. And we'll be discussing that uh, tomorrow in our last webinar. But what we can see here is a big movement towards a higher uh, repair. And then the next question is, are companies ready to start repairing uh, more products? So we asked that question to all of the companies in the match platform, and we actually broke that down into three main areas. So the first one was, how far is your company business unit 
in supporting and servicing the product during the use phase by providing maintenance, consultancy, advice, and so forth. The second one was in relation to um, providing services to repair products, aiming to extend the overall lifetime of those products. And the third one was connected to uh, establishing some sharing platforms, which can encourage shared product use and access. And the main idea here is to enhance the utilization of products that might be used for a very low amount of time by a single user, but at the point that we share, then it's possible to uh, enhance that quite a lot and avoid the need uh, of new products uh, in the market. I know that now you might be curious to hear more about what the data uh, says to us and how ready are the companies in relation to use support and maintenance uh, in the match platform. So over to you, uh, Tim, could you tell us a little bit more about that? Of course, yeah, thanks Daniela. So from those three questions that Daniela has just uh, gone through with you, we've of course collected data here as well. So in our uh, platform here in the dashboard, we can see that uh, use support and maintenance is it's not one of the higher areas of readiness in the companies that have um, uh, completed the platform uh, or completed their uh, readiness assessment in the platform, but it's sort of uh, in the middle. Interestingly, we can see quite a spread already when you look at the graphs of the bar charts uh, below in the, diff the readiness on the three different areas here, which is quite interesting. They're almost uh, a perfect, uh, uh, perfectly uh, different in their, uh, in their forms. But before we go into there, let's have a look at uh, the readiness from a sector perspective. Not surprisingly, you could say there is a, a rather large difference between the, the top performers being, in this case, electronics, motor vehicles, uh, trailers and accessories, and machinery, all the way down to the less ready, which is the more uh, metals and metal products, uh, manufacturing companies and building materials. And this is quite interesting because it's quite different to some of the, diff the other dimensions we've been sharing with you, where building materials has been the absolute uh, most ready area. Again, not surprising because of the, 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 the technology focus, and the actual characteristics of this dimension, but it's showing the importance of measuring our readiness on a dimension by dimension perspective. So your overall circular economy readiness uh, is interesting to look at and compare, but it's even more interesting when you drill down into these different dimensions. So let's have a look then uh, in terms of the, uh, the different type of, of company. Interestingly here also, uh, B2G companies are uh, in this case, the, uh, the, the top performers in terms of uh, feeling ready. And when we see B2G is companies which are in the, in the market of business to government uh, 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 business and not business to consumer business to business. This is actually the area where they are the, uh, the top performing. And then it's relatively even uh, in terms of the size of the companies. Okay, let's go and have a look at the three different aspects of this dimension uh, in turn. First of all, in terms of service support, which is about um, understanding how to support the, the products uh, or uh, assets during use, like maintenance, consultancy, advice, and so forth. Here we see quite a, a, a large uh, spread. And if we go into scaling up initiatives, we can see, again, it's still electronics, which is top performer, but together with, interestingly here, furniture and wood and paper products, and uh, motor vehicles, trailers, and accessories. So I think that the furniture one has, if we just click out again, who's moved up the list here. So the, the companies which have been going in and, and uh, doing their readiness here, maybe just a little bit, but uh, uh, within furniture, we can see actually quite a lot of initiatives in uh, selling furniture as a service. And furniture as a service, of course, uh, well, actually not of course, but uh, we, we've seen that uh, many companies within the office furniture uh, sphere and market are putting sensory technology into their, uh, their their furniture so that they can provide it as a service. So this is actually quite a nice um, little um, outlier here. If you look at the ones which are not quite as, as ready, which have not started, we can see that um, the um, this is uh, predominantly companies, if it's, it's taking its time today, our internet seems to be slow. It's the first time we've had a little technical glitch. 
there we go. So here we see that the ones which are not ready, um, it's, uh, it, it, it's a different demographic again with motor vehicles and trailer accessories being the, uh, the, the most populous uh, one here. If we go back now and look at uh, the uh, questions uh, again, repair services, we can see this is very, very evenly spread. So it, it seems that in general companies which are repairing their products in order to extend their lifetime, it's, uh, it's quite a different spread. And if we go into to the, uh, the ones which are scaling up here, we can see that uh, within this particular uh, part of the, uh, of, of the readiness, the companies are and now we're waiting very, very uh, with bated breath to see the, the result. There we go. Um, it's still electronics, is it? No, it's not moved yet. So we're having a, this is the first time that our platform has not performed under the webinar. We didn't do too badly up until now. There we go. We can see here that the ones which are leading its machinery in terms of uh, uh, industrial machinery, so heavy capital goods, uh, agriculture and forestry, and then electronics, furniture again, motor vehicles and so forth. Um, uh, in terms of ones which have not started, again, the, the, the mix is um, um, quite, uh, quite similar. So we're looking at building materials, furniture and wood and so forth. So there's a, quite a spread there. Let's look back now into this area of, uh, actually it's one of the aspects within the whole of the match uh, platform where there is the least amount of readiness. And this is in creating sharing platforms to encourage shared product use and access. And this is somewhat surprising because uh, we've seen in the other di dimensions, which we've uh, talked about on early webinars as well, that this whole idea of, of new business models and new uh, product to service business models and so forth have been really interesting. But we can see that actually creating sharing platforms, uh, despite the the big focus on the business model aspect, we can see very little uh, evidence from the companies in that they're feeling ready in, in terms of this area. So we're seeing that uh, they, uh, this, is, this is how the landscape looks here, but still it's B2G uh, companies. And the, the ones which are actually doing uh, something in this area are uh, machinery, agriculture, and forestry, and motor vehicles. So we can see the ones who are actually doing sharing platforms are within sort of car sharing systems or um, maintenance systems for agriculture. So that was the insights there. Back to you, Daniela. Thank you very much, Tim. And uh, with that, we basically finished the main uh, presentations we had in relation to use, support and maintenance. And it's time now to get back to the questions. Yes. And Daniela, the first question is to you because in our last webinar and in the beginning of this one, you talked about these three mega trends, one being digitalization, circular economy, both of them that we're covering with the match platform. And the third one is urbanization. Marina is asking whether we are planning to integrate um, urbanization into our projects. Yeah, thank you for the good question, Marina. And definitely urbanization is a very important area uh, for circular economy as well, and could actually be really uh, looking into in order to be able to enhance how circular our cities, regions and countries are today. Uh, we are just now looking to several different ways to expand the match platform uh, beyond the manufacturing industry and looking to readiness of cities is one of the areas that we are really exploring. So how can we measure how ready uh, a city is? What are the key dimensions for that? And then on the basis of these, how can we help cities with recommendations and tools to become uh, more circular over time? We are also looking at many other areas such as agri-food, uh, for instance, also startups, the service organizations, uh, consultancies, and so on and so forth. So our youth made goal is to have uh, a number of different platforms in match that can bring this uh, systemic overview and that can be combined in many different ways uh, to support uh, companies, organizations, and also citizens to become more circular. Uh, we hope to be able to share some good news in relation to the developments of Match in the near future uh, with you all. Thank you. Um, Tim, 
um, we have a question uh, regarding sometimes when something needs to be repaired, it needs to be transported uh, maybe to another country or at least a different region. Have you or have we looked into uh, the transportation and the uh, sustainability impact that could have? Yeah, so we haven't any, any cases in the match project as such that have looked uh, specifically at that. Um, but it is, of course, an important area to, to focus on. Um, we've, in other projects, um, been very aware of uh, the exactly this, you could say the knock-on effect or maybe a rebound effect of having maintenance systems if we don't have the, um, the right infrastructure in place to do those repairs. And we have a strong recommendation, of course, on using local agents and local um, uh, subcontractors to, to do maintenance activities. The best and I guess the oldest example of, of this type of an activity is from Rolls-Royce, who uh, don't necessarily have Rolls-Royce uh, maintenance technicians in every single air, uh, airport to maintain their airplanes, but actually uh, do subcontracting and, and training of locally based um, maintenance people to, to, to do uh, such maintenance activities. And similarly, if you look into the retail uh, branch, um, supermarket uh, cooling systems, for example, both uh, Damfoss, which is a, a Danish company in the uh, refrigeration business, but also uh, the American company Emerson, uh, and all uh, many other um, players on this market have remote monitoring systems to maintain their equipment uh, throughout its life cycle, making sure that it is most uh, effective and efficient uh, in usage and also monitoring for faults. Uh, but they, they do not necessarily have representatives in every single country. So they make sure that they um, have, have locals there. So it is, it's a really important one to, to focus on so that we don't create a, a maintenance and repair culture, which is uh, having a rebound effect of uh, shipping something very heavy and costly, both from a cost and an environmental cost perspective. Yeah. Thank you. Daniela, from, from the data set that Tim presented just before, we had some sharp eyes from a marina that noticed that the B2B sector is uh, performing poorly compared to B2G and, and the B2C. Um, that's a, a bit weird because they might be more dependent on good relationships uh, with their customers. Uh, do you have an explanation for that? Yeah, we were also asking ourselves um, about that. And what we realize is that many of the uh, companies that are, for example, acquiring machinery or maybe airplanes, they do have their own maintenance departments that are actually the ones be, being uh, responsible for maintaining the products and providing the functions that they should be uh, performing. And uh, for those companies, it's quite of a big difference to uh, allow their suppliers to, to be the responsible ones for maintenance because it might mean an increased risk. And it might also mean that they need to have many different types of suppliers internally in their organizations to be able to provide those services to all of the different types of products that they are uh, acquiring. If we look at uh, airplanes, for instance, Lufthansa in Germany, they do have a huge uh, department for maintaining and repairing the aircrafts um, and for them that would be a really big change to uh, to give access to all of the airplane manufacturers. This could be the reason for that. We also are exploring um, how business to business companies can acquire more product service systems that would then if that happened enable that all of the services during the use phase are done by the PSS provider but we can still see some resistance um, in relation to that. Thank you, Daniela. And related to that, uh, Tim, um, if we assume that, that B2G, so uh, companies that cater for governments, they have higher requirements in terms of maintaining the, the services they deliver to the governments. What can we do to uh, improve and maybe think in the same ways to the B2B and B2C uh, companies? Yeah, I think it's a nice question. So green public procurement is actually um, it, it's somehow a, a hidden champion somewhere in a sustainability from a sustainability perspective. It, it really is uh, leading the the way in terms of um, how to, to to forge the way ahead for uh, for good practice generally. And I think that the, I know 
I know that there's a focus within the, the European Union at looking at uh, green public procurement to, to learn how we can develop policy uh, in, in the, uh, the private sector. I think that um, actually the video that, that Daniela showed is quite a nice example of uh, some uh, increasing regulation that we can expect over coming years exactly in uh, understanding um, longer life products, more main maintainable products. And I think we're going to see an increase on that as the, uh, the, the European uh, uh, Green Deal unfolds, as we look at the, uh, the whole climate uh, deal within the European Union of the, uh, the CO2 reduction goals, which have just been agreed on uh, within the EU and so forth. And uh, I think also now is going to be going very qu quickly in the US uh, if, uh, to, to judge by the first few days of the last couple of weeks. So I think that from these perspectives, we can see that there will be a, a bigger focus on uh, maintainability and, and, and longer life. But we need to be careful that we don't just lengthen the life of products if it's actually a good idea to retire certain products and technologies. Again, another type of a technology rebound effect. So I think that, um, yeah, that was a long answer to the question, but I think the idea is that um, as we see uh, regulation increasing over the years within this area, I think that the private market, so B2C and B2B, will start to, um, to, to increase there. And there's some nice examples in that video that Daniela showed of different countries, how they're tackling that. Thank you, Tim. The last question is, is for you, Daniela, and that is from Heather. And she notices that sharing systems are also performing low in terms of the use support and maintenance. Do you have an explanation for that? Yeah, we need to remember that the data that we are showing are coming from manufacturing companies. And what we see is that usually the sharing systems, they are being developed by third parties that buy products from the manufacturers or from dealers. And then on the basis of those products, they provide the sharing systems. Um, but what we can also see is that there's a trend that more and more manufacturing companies are moving from the product sales to the actual uh, product service system solutions and we might expect uh, in the near future that they will be also implementing some new sharing systems for many different types of products and uh, both for business to consumer and also uh, business to business. We can see that is a starting. You know, we can see some good pilots uh, running and we expect that this will become much more uh, relevant in the near future. Thank you. And thank you all for, for your questions here for the Q&A session. Uh, I think that finishes uh, today's um, session. And tomorrow we will be uh, doing the final webinars. We'll be focusing on take back and end of life strategies. And then we'll uh, end off with policy and market. Tim, you're responsible for the first part. What's on the menu? Yeah, so uh, take back and end of life strategies is a really important one to, to focus on because of course, we are still in a linear economy and uh, what to do with what's out there that was designed 20, 30, 40 years ago, what on earth should we do with it? And when do we get it back? How can we make the, the, the judgment about um, which possibility it has to loop within which cycle? So that's what we're going to be looking at there, the readiness to be able to do that. Thank you. And Daniela, you touched upon policy uh, earlier with your video. What can we expect from uh, tomorrow's presentation on policy and market? Yeah, what's going to happen is that we're going to move from an internal evaluation of companies that we've been doing since the first webinar. And we start looking externally in terms of policy as an enabler, as we could see uh, in the video, but also as uh, a barrier for circular economy implementation. Just now, many countries are really looking to their legal frameworks to try to understand uh, what are the different initiatives that can enable, but also that can hinder uh, circularity. And what we're going to see tomorrow is how much companies know about it and how much that influences their decisions in relation to circularity. And we will also look in the market from a customer's point of view and try to understand how companies are actually um, um, trying to understand whether customers are ready for more circular solutions, for secondhand products, for refurbished products, or maybe for recycled materials, and trying to understand on the basis of that 
how to best frame their new value propositions and their new products. So much more to come uh, tomorrow, Steve. Great, thank you. I'm looking forward to that, Daniela. And thank you all for, for attending us today. Uh, hopefully see you all tomorrow again. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.